faces, there are some new faces. Um, this is our last merit rounds of this academic year. Um, I'm going to do a little plug before I introduce our speaker. Um, if this is the first time you've been to uh, Merit Rounds, then this is something that we continue on a monthly basis the second Tuesday of every month. Is that right? I think it's the third. Third? Third. Great. Yeah. And, uh, uh, for a second there, I was like, that doesn't feel like it's the second. It's the third. Yeah. Um, we will be back up and live in September. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about Merit, you can find us at merit.mcmaster.ca. Uh, and there's one event that, if you don't have it in your calendar, we really encourage you to think about attending, which is June 5th. That is not quite uh, two weeks away. It's a Wednesday. It's our Norman Education Research Day. And so we have about 80 different uh, poster and abstract presentations. Uh, we have a keynote that begins the day and concludes the day. Um, you can find a lot more information on our website, merit.mcmaster.ca. That's uh, space repetition right there. You're getting all your education <laughs> learning science in one go. Um, so you're not here to hear advertisements, but you are here to hear from Dr. Ann Wong. Many of you know her, but I think it's really important to highlight some of the things that she has done. So I'm going to read from a very short portion of her biography. Otherwise, I would use up probably a good portion of her hour. Uh, so Dr. Wong is a professor and associate chair of education in the Department of Anesthesia. She is the Assistant Dean for Program for Faculty Development and the Director of the Academic Leadership Program. She holds a PhD in International and Comparative Education, and she teaches in the MSc in Global Health, the Master of Health Sciences Education, and the Clinician Educator Diploma here. She's truly a polymath. Dr. Wong. Okay, thank you so much. Actually, by reading you a quote from a male leader that I had interviewed from a study, a mixed method study, uh, looking at gender and leadership about a year ago. And so this person says, What do I think of gender and leadership? There's a somewhat naive part of me that's not so sure why it becomes an issue. Because if you look at performance, why would gender suddenly become an issue? What well, makes a woman more or less likely to be a good leader than a man? But part of me says, What's the fuss? The part of me realizes it clearly is an issue somewhere. Another male participant said this, does gender matter? I think it's the skills fundamentally that matter as opposed to the gender. There may be some different challenges with gender, but I'm sure it doesn't fundamentally matter. I'm sure it's the skills that the individual brings to their job. So what these two individuals with the best of uh, intentions express is their belief that in gender equality, that women and men are equally capable. And they also express a belief in, our, in meritocracy as the final arbiter of leadership attainment. In other words, it's not about your gender, it's not about your race, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, or other identities. What really counts is whether you can do the job. So given these beliefs, which are common, pervasive, they were truly baffled as to why, in this day and age, there continues to be a problem regarding gender and leadership. So in contrast, when we interviewed the women, uh, even though female and male leaders had equal, or sorry, um, had very similar um, values of leadership and leadership approaches, the women's leadership attainment experiences were quite different. For women, the leadership attainment was not was less about skills or abilities, but more about whether they had the institutional and societal recognition and support to become leaders. So as one woman stated, there have been fewer opportunities for, for women in leadership positions. It's been difficult for women because they sometimes choose pathways because of different priorities in their lives, and then it's hard for them to get back on track. There's more societal support for male counterparts to be in leadership positions. So, as you can see, these different uh, perceptions and this, uh, experiences of female and male leaders um, show us that these differences, uh, these conceptual uh, and experiential gaps need to be bridged if we're going to make headway on the gender gap in leadership. So, 
The purpose of my talk then is to examine some of the reasons for why the gender gap in leadership continues to exist. And in my talk, I hope to do three things. I hope to um, put forth that gender does matter in leadership. It matters to um, as to whether you're seen as a leader, and it matters how you're treated as a leader. In other words, I'd like to conceptualize leadership as a gendered construct. Given this, I'd also like to um, look at the notion of meritocracy, deconstruct it, and unpack the myth of meritocracy that in fact continue to perpetuate the gender gap. And finally, I'd like to discuss the implications for the individual program and institution. So I'd like to preface before I go into my talk that uh, there are a number of things. I do take the uh, definition of gender as binary, so I acknowledge that that's a limitation. I also focus specifically on gender, acknowledging that all the other uh, issues such as race, class, uh, ethnicity, all the other identities are just as important in these, these kinds of discussions, as well as intersectionality, the combination of those identities. Um, and I primarily focus uh, my um, talk on um, uh, leadership in the academic setting. So, let's get started. Is there a problem? Yes, there's a problem. Uh, the facts show that there is definitely um, a persistent uh, gender gap uh, in terms of female participation in leadership. Uh, that is improving, but at the very top ranks, it really has hardly budged. And this um, slide is quite busy, but it summarizes uh, So what it is, I'm going to try to, sorry, this is falling down. Um, so it's quite busy. But basically what it is, it's a, um, a survey from the University and College Staff System Survey from StatCan. And basically what it shows you is the number of full-time academic faculty uh, by rank and gender, uh, starting from 1970 all the way to 2016, to 2017. So I'm just going to focus on the 2016-17 uh, um, figures. So essentially what it shows is the breakdown um, in uh, um, number of males and number of females as assistant professors, associate professors, and um, full professors. And uh, the fact remains that even though since the 1990s, females greatly outnumber males in enrollment, the only 39% of the um, professors are female. There was a great discrepancy on that. Also, shows that uh, for the female and male assistant professors, they're fairly close, actually, in terms of parity. Uh, about 48% of the assistant uh, professors are female, but uh, this drops off quite dramatically as you get higher. So for the associate uh, female um, professors, it's, it's over here, and the male associate is over, is over here. So the female associate professors drop down to 36%, and the most dramatic is at the full professor level, where it's red. So the red here are the female full professors, and the dark blue here are the male full professors. So the percentage of male full professors is 75%. So only a quarter or less are uh, female. And many other statistics, you can find all kinds of statistics from all walks uh, that basically confirm um, my proposition to you that leadership is uh, gendered. And there are many reasons that have been put forward as to why this is so, um, ranging from women have to take time, uh, they want to have children to take care of family, um, they lack confidence, they lack the skills, they lack the desire uh, to become leaders, um, or there's overt uh, discrimination against them. Um, in this talk, I'm actually going to be focusing on one thing, and that thing is on the notion of meritocracy and how meritocracy uh, contributes quite a big deal to this gap. So we're going to work on this and unpack that. Before we do so, however, um, I'd like to first start with the uh, definition of um, leadership. So when we think of Leadership, and we think of a leader, 
we often have this image of um, someone who has certain abilities, certain traits, um, certain uh, special characteristics, someone who's going to take charge uh, is be at the helm. And this is the sort of idea that is prevalent in a lot of leadership development programs where the goal is to develop your leadership skills. But let's flip that idea around and um, look at another way of looking at leadership. Let's look at it from the perspective of the followers. Um, from this perspective, a leader can only lead if they have followers. So the simplest definition of a leader is they have followers. So from this perspective then, um, a leader can only lead if the followers let them lead. And the leader can only lead if the system gives them the followers who will let them lead. So in other words, using this model, leadership can be understood then to be a gendered construct that is embedded in a system of allowance of avoidance. So what do I mean by that? I mean that beyond a certain uh, level of confidence, Leadership is not so much about your ability, but about whether the system will allow you to be a leader. So, does the system afford you? So, allowance, affordances, and some sort of similarly. So, does it afford you the opportunities to be recognized as a leader, to be invited to the table? Does it afford you your followers? Do they follow you? Does the organizational culture afford you? the support that you need to sustain, that can set you up for success. So if we use this model of leadership, um, I would argue then that the notion of meritocracy is actually one of the system affordances that affect and impact leadership attainment. So what do we mean when we talk about meritocracy? This term was coined in 1958 uh, by Michael Young, who's a British sociologist, and he defines it as a social system in which merit or talent is the basis for sorting people's positions and distributing uh, awards. So in a meritocracy then, everyone has an equal chance to advance and get rewarded based on their individual um, merit, their efforts, uh, regardless of their gender, race, class, and other factors. So it sounds really appealing. It's very equitable um, it's, um, on the surface, and in principle, uh, it's neutral, it makes sense, um, it's um, a fair, objective way of recognizing talent and rewarding people for them, and it's something that is very persuasive and it's very great. It's the core value of many institutions and organizations, uh, especially academic institutions. <coughs> by the general public, by the So that's the principle. But in practice, it's the you know, notion of meritocracy is very fraught. And it's particularly fraught, uh, it's unexamined, because it hides a lot of biases and assumptions underneath it, seeming virtue, virtuous and near. So especially if you ask, well, who gets to define what is meant by meritocracy? On what basis? Who gets to judge who's good, who is not good? So that's how I'm going to set it up. I'm going to next turn um, to uh, talking uh, about uh, the notion of meritocracy, unpacking it, and then problematizing what I would call um, some of the myths of meritocracy. Uh, First myth, um, which I think, I hope I worked, uh, started to work at, uh, on already, is that leadership uh, is all about your ability. So that's the first myth. Second one is that meritocratic institutions uh, promote gender equity. And thirdly, that diversity is meritocracy. So our first myth. A big obstacle. Um, to true meritocracy is uh, the fact of implicit uh, bias, which is hardwired into every one of us. 
Um, and I'd like to show you that when it comes to implicit bias, unfortunately, the odds are stacked against women as leaders. And remember, it's hardwired, so it's very hard. So, what is implicit uh, bias? Well, as an evolutionary mode of survival, our human brains um, have developed cognitive processes uh, or heuristics or shortcuts so that we can quickly uh, examine, and recognize, and react to stimuli uh, in order to protect ourselves for survival. So, you know, friend or foe, stay or, or flee. And uh, these uh, processes are um, automatic, they're unconscious, it just happens. Um, and they were developed from very early childhood uh, onwards over the um, uh, course of a lifetime um, due to our experiences and due to socialization. So the phenomenon of implicit bias refers to the discriminatory biases from implicit attitudes uh, or stereotypes that can unconsciously affect our decisions and behavior. And this is in spite of unconsciously held values. Uh, and so that's the insidious thing about implicit bias. We don't are not consciously aware that they're actually affecting what decisions we make, how we perceive things, and the actions that we take. And this often plays into um, issues of that result in gender bias. So how do we you know that implicit bias exists. Uh, one of the ways is measured through the implicit association test. So, show of hands, has anyone done these tests? Okay, a number of you have. Did you find some interesting, unexpected results? Well, for those of you who haven't taken it, there is a, a website. It's called Project Implicit. It was developed in 1998. Uh, by Greenwald and his colleagues in, um, in Harvard University. And basically what it does is a measure um, uh, of uh, the response time to uh, word associations between concepts and descriptors. So concepts and descriptors that seem to go naturally together in our minds, uh, you can react to them a lot uh, easier to categorize than if they were switched around. So they divide the test into two parts. Uh, and the faster reaction uh, test really shows that basically the conclusion shows your implicit um, preference for that particular grouping of concept and descriptors. So I'm going to show you a screenshot as we uh, illustrate a little bit better what I mean by that. So you're going to the website, uh, and actually it's not just looking at gender, it looks at race, age, um, it looks at um, ethnicity, uh, weight, all those things. But there's different tests for other, uh, for different implicit associations. So disabilities, well. disabilities, yes. It's mm -hmm. got all kinds of, so it's quite interesting. You can look at the range of social characteristics. And um, the computer screen is divided to two sides, and you're presented um, a word in the middle, and you are to categorize it into the right or left quadrant depending on what, where you think it belongs. So for this one, um, where does it belong? Right side, right? <laughs> so, the, so it measures automatically the time it took you to do that categorization. Then they do this word association. So science or male, humanities or female, and then they put biology. So where would you categorize that? Right or left side? Left, okay. Uh, so that's, these are examples of one of those. Uh, but then they also have a section where they switch it around. The so humanities are male, science are female. So where would you put the middle one? Can't. Right. Yeah. So they're, they do this on multiple occasions and they're measuring your response time. So the response time that's fastest, fastest is the one that gives them an idea. <coughs> And so, what did they find? Well, I, I'm sorry to say that universally, um, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, both genders um, have an implicit uh, association preference 
for linking women, uh, females with family and with humanity, and males with careers and science. So this is shown repeatedly. And again, it's in spite of your conscious belief. And so uh, by interpretation then, uh, we can say that both male and female um, favor, implicitly associate um, leadership with male. What are other examples of implicit bias uh, that favor males in leadership um, other than the um, IAT? Uh, in the literature. Uh, as far back as 1999, Steinpress um, did a study in which they distributed CVs that were identical except for the names on the CV. So it's a male name versus a female name. And asked the faculty to rate them as to who they would preferably hire. And invariably, uh, whether the rater was female or male, the male candidate got picked uh, preferentially, even though they were exactly the same CV. Uh, a more recent example of that is um, uh, Moss Rekison, uh, who did a similar um, kind of comparison. Um, and uh, this uh, was um, applying for um, a lab job and circulated uh, the CV and application material of uh, the candidate uh, to a fairly highly um, uh, research intensive university and asked faculty to, again, rate them, and they only differed uh, by name, and again, it came out that the uh, application forms and, uh, of the um, candidate with the male name uh, came out to, uh, to be preferred. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Whiteman and uh, et al. study uh, at CIHR, where they uh, looked at um, uh, the um, success rates of male and female applicant uh, uh, grants, so CIHR grants. Uh, depending on whether the criteria was based on the project alone, i.e. the science, versus um, whether the, when the criteria was based on the personal uh, person. Uh, and they found that when we used the criteria of looking at the project, the male and female um, had a uh, rough, pretty well equal uh, chance of success, whereas if it was rating the person, that uh, the male outnumbered the female. And similarly, with the VR resident uh, milestone evaluation uh, dial at all, uh, looked uh, at uh, faculty evaluations of female and male ER residents um, and found that uh, at the beginning they were uh, rated uh, uh, you know, on equal terms uh, in the first year, but as they progressed through their residency, the uh, male uh, residents got rated. Um, uh, as being uh, as having reached a milestone a lot faster than the female uh, residents so by two to four months, which was quite significant. And um, finally, um, there's uh, an example from Brooks and All and the investors. So uh, she was looking at um, success in uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, pitches by both men and uh, male-led companies and female-led companies. So it's sort of like a dragon's den. Uh, they wanted to see, you know. Um, uh, with the differences in who got funded, and they found that uh, certainly over 60% of the um, uh, of the pitches were funded uh, for male-led companies. Um, they did another experiment, however, where they recorded the pitches. Uh, they had ex exactly the same pitches, uh, the same sort of um, uh, the same um, dialogue. Um, and um, they compared, and it was just done by audio. So the only uh, difference between the pitches uh, was that it was either narrated by a male voice or a female voice. And again, they found that all the people were So these are many, many examples that uh, show you, uh, that reinforce that um, males were favored uh, over females. Uh, in terms of leadership, in terms of uh, perceptions of competency, uh, and so on, even though objectively they were equally competent. So going back to the first message, it's not all about your ability. Okay. Leadership is not all about your Okay, so myth uh, number two. Uh, merit merit uh, institutions promote gender equity. In fact, 
interestingly, um, they don't, and this has been empirically shown. Uh, so Emilio Castella is a um, professor at uh, MIT Sloan School of Management, and he uh, was pioneering researcher on this. And he actually found that institutions that explicitly espouse their autonomy actually paradoxically result in more gender and racial bias and perpetuation of in, uh, inequity. And he calls this the paradox of meritocracy. Uh, and what he did was he did several uh, separate experiments uh, involving over 400 participants. Um, and he essentially uh, gave them portfolios that were, like, that were similar uh, or um, pretty well equal. Equal portfolios, one with a male um, name and the other one with a female name. And he divided the participants into two groups. One who were told that uh, they needed to rate uh, the portfolios according to merit. Uh, that, that, that was the reward criteria because the institution which these uh, candidates uh, belonged to um, really strongly um, was a uh, believed in meritocracy. Uh, the other uh, group uh, were given the same task were not told anything about uh, merit as being the criteria, the reward criteria, or anything about the institution from which these portfolios came. And what they found that uh, was that um, those who were told that uh, the rating was based on merit uh, came from an um, uh, institution that uh, was known to be uh, um, a supportive of meritocracy actually um, ended up re preferentially rewarding the male uh, portfolio over the female, even though they were uh, equivalent. Whereas that did not happen for those that uh, were not told, so given those instructions. And in fact, interestingly enough, the reverse happened that the female um, portfolios got rated higher than the male. So, why is that? A uh, number of um, hypotheses. Uh, the main one, though, is um, Castilla felt that uh, an organizational culture that um, self identifies as meritocratic may give uh, Evaluates a false sense of confidence, of fairness, and objectivity, um, a phenomenon called moral credentialing. So it just gives you that nice veneer or that nice sort of title that we're uh, all about um, fairness and uh, equity. And so it blinds them to their own biases or questioning the biases that may be present in the system or in the institution. So it almost uh, acts as a, a bit of a smoke screen. Another way that uh, meritocratic, meritocratic um, institutions have done a poor job uh, in terms of uh, failing to uh, promote gender equity is their um, uh, failure to recognize what we call second generation bias. So what is that? Well, they've done a very good job in recognizing first generation uh, bias, which is the over discrimination. We have laws against that. But uh, the more insidious types of biases are actually uh, ones that are embedded, invisibly incorporated into the system and the structure of the organization and its practices. Um, so I sort of see second generation bias as similar to the hidden curriculum in education. Um, and it's very hard. Um, it's, it's very subtle, and but it has major impact just because it's not recognized. It's insidious, and a lot of people who are affected by it think it's really it's them, it's their fault. Um, so where does this come from? Um, it can be um, uh, defined as gender-based uh, dynamics that arise from invisibly embedded historical, structural, organizational, cultural norms, values, and practices. So the universities and all major academic institutions were created historically at a time where it was a traditionally patriarchal society. So a lot of the structures reflect that, uh, but over time they've become so normalized and so entrenched um, that we just don't recognize them. They're neutral, they're just ways of the way we do it, and also it's not overt or intentional. They've just become part of the structure. And so function often follows structure. And the result of that is that uh, they can result in powerful but subtle invisible messages and barriers that we don't necessarily overtly recognize, which may over inadvertently benefit men at the, um, and at the disadvantage of women. 
And it's very, as I mentioned, it's very hard to recognize, and um, both men and women have difficulty identifying. Them. So if that's the case, how do we um, identify or look at second generation uh, bias? Um, it can be gleaned indirectly through institutional policies and practices uh, regarding, let's say, uh, career paths, um, what career paths are valued, uh, parental and uh, family leave policy, um, reward systems, promotion and tenure. Um, so criteria like, like that could be um, a clue as to what the institution values and whether they value uh, gender diversity. So, for example, we know that women, um, even um, very busy career women, um, and although it's improving, uh, they still do the bulk of the um, uh, home uh, care, um, the child rearing, uh, and so on and so forth. And so as a result, for many women, uh, it results in a lot of work interruption, um, that they have to take time off either to have children or to take care of them, and so on. And so this has ramifications in how their career unfolds uh, in their productivity and their promotion uh, prospects. So if the institution doesn't recognize that and still value the, their contributions and uh, doesn't accommodate a policy, that can be seen as an example of a second generation bias. Uh, so, you know, the other thing that you can look at uh, in terms of um, second generation bias or perhaps the hidden curriculum of leadership is Look at who's at the top. Um, what is the gender distribution at the top? And top leadership is really important because they basically uh, make policy decisions that affect the rest of the university. So who's at the top? And also uh, look at who's doing what at the top. Uh, because oftentimes you'll see that uh, people get into gendered um, uh, career paths even at the top. So uh, for example, uh, women um, leaders often tend to be um, recommended or thought to be good at uh, sort of more behind the scenes types of um, leadership positions like um, team building or collaborating types of um, position, uh, positions, whereas men are seen more suitable for sort of the, you know, take charge, front line kind of work. Um, so that can happen that uh, they get slotted into those gendered career paths even at uh, the different levels of, of leadership. Um, and look at uh, meetings, whose voice is heard, um, what work is recognized, uh, what administrative support uh, do you get, um, and uh, when you do get into leadership, uh, how much um, support is there in terms of uh, furthering your leadership development, uh, your mentorship um, uh, opportunities, and so on. Um, are there differences? Um, also in the literature, uh, there are other uh, more subtle themes that can be gleaned also have an idea that um, the second generation biases, in a similar way, work at an institutional level in the same way that implicit bias works for the individual. So um, uh, Boyko et al. and Bula et al. Uh, did similar studies, one in the States and uh, one in um, Canada, where uh, they looked at the uh, percentage of uh, invited women speakers at Grand Round, and both of them found underrepresentation. Um, Files et al. did an interesting study where they um, reviewed the videotaped um, Grand Rounds and looked at how speakers were introduced at uh, Grand Rounds, and they found that um, if um, it was a woman introducer, 95% of the time they would introduce the speaker, whether it was male or female, by formal titles. Uh, on the other hand, if the introducer uh, was male, um, only 72% of the time they would introduce the male um, speaker by their uh, formal title. But that goes down to 49% if the speaker was female. Now, I'm glad to say that Jonathan did not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I read that study. <laughs> 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 so, so these are sort of clues, um, you know, that ne not necessarily are reflective of the institution, but you know, uh, it could be reflective of the culture that, that's just in the corner that we can see in. Other ways that uh, second generation biases um, can be uh, invisibly uh, promoted, or in what are otherwise uh, meritocratic institutions. 
are two phenomena that um, the role incongruity theory um, as well as the glass split. So um, the role the role incongruity theory uh, was um, um, pioneered by uh, Eagley um, and her colleagues. And essentially, it basically uh, refers to what we've already talked about, which is the explicit association of uh, traditional um, male um, um, uh, stereotypic uh, characteristics that shows aggressiveness, decisiveness, um, action-oriented with the leadership role. Um, and yet, the female gender role is stereotypically um, thought of as being very warm, nurturing, you know, that's the sort of the, uh, term they use. Uh, and so um, female leaders have um, a double bind. They have it stacked against them. Because first of all, they're female, so they're expected to be warm, communal, um, and nurturing. But at the same time, they're also leaders. And as leaders, they're expected to be decisive, agentic. And so they run into this issue about, first of all, not necessarily um, uh, being taken uh, seriously as leaders. Um, and uh, so therefore judged more harshly uh, than their male, male counterparts. Um, and on the other hand, uh, for them to uh, be seen as leaders, they have to, uh, and also be accepted by their followers in a favorable way, uh, they have to exhibit both. Whereas male leaders typically do not have to worry about uh, the double block bond. And I'm realizing as I'm speaking that I seem to be, you know, talking in polarized terms. I don't mean to say that. I think these are um, broad generalizations, but they are grounded in research evidence. So, you know, I'm not saying that the women are any less biased than the men, um, uh, and so on, but uh, these findings are grounded in, uh, in empirical findings. Uh, the glass cliff phenomenon, really interesting phenomenon. So, um, has anyone heard of the glass cliff phenomenon? <laughs> I didn't know what I mean, but you recognize it, okay. Well, it's an interesting, well, this is an interesting way of uh, describing it, this crisis in female. And basically, it refers to the phenomenon, and this is the kicker, you know, when women are allowed to be leaders, it's usually during times of crisis. So it refers to the, the research that shows that there's uh, an interesting propensity for companies and institutions to appoint a women leader when it's in crisis. Um, and so I don't know uh, how many of you remember Kim Campbell, our first female prime minister, who basically got put in that untenable position when Barnum um, Rowley decided to retire a couple of months before an impending election. She had to go in and clean up the mess, and unfortunately it didn't work in her favor. Uh, and, uh, and the most um, recent one, Theresa May, uh, post Brexit. Um, yeah, who is another good example of that one? Yeah, Matt, yeah, who's, yeah. Lot, there's lots of examples. Um, Ryan and Haslam uh, were the originators of, uh, of uh, they've done a lot of research and uh, they've done at least uh, over 10 years. We did a recent uh, review that uh, over the past 10 years of research into this phenomena. So why, why does that happen? Well, there's many reasons that have been put forth. Uh, first of all, um, organizations who are in crisis don't really have much to lose. That's one of the reasons. So, you know, they're already in crisis. Uh, there's not much to lose by appointing a woman. So if, the, if, they, if the women fail, well, that just confirms our bias that they're not really suited for leaders. But if they don't fail, then it's kudos to the organization for being so progressive. Um, <laughs> um, also, you know, uh, women leaders um, have been thought of as being better at handling crises, bringing people together, complementing. Management. So that's another reason why women may be moved towards as leaders during these kinds of crises. Um, it also, companies do like to look good, as I mentioned, uh, or it could be a signal that we're changing direction, we're doing something innovative. Um, and also, um, fewer men in these crisis situations find it attractive to step in and clean up the crisis. So there's more room, so to speak, for women, they say, and so there's less competition, is one of the thoughts on this. Um, and uh, so, you know, women get a chance to, to be a leader. But the problem with this is, of course, it's very precarious. They're, they're entering leadership at a time where just everything is, is not good set up for them. 
Um, and so um, it is uh, a problem, uh, problematic because it is a potential setup for the to fail, which reinforces um, the type. So, um, in other words, uh, just to summarize, myth number um, two, I hope I've given you enough examples really to um, shake your idea that meritocratic institutions actually promote um, gender uh, equity. It is prob it's problematic. May not always do that for the reasons I've talked about. And finally, um, a prevalent myth is that diversity is actually reducing or diluting meritocracy. And uh, certainly Justin Trudeau did not think that's the case. Uh, so uh, this is a you know, famous uh, quip um, that can uh, return uh, to your question. Uh, and, uh, Essentially, he made it a mandate to ensure that his inaugural cabinet uh, was uh, gender equal. But it is controversial, um, and there is a lot of debate about whether recruitment um, methods that focus on gender equity and diversity, um, uh, such as gender quotas, um, promote or reduce uh, meritocracy. And certainly, those who are against quotas um, argue primarily that they decrease. So they talked about how well if women or whoever um, the quota is for uh, were really uh, capable, they would be there. But there's just not enough of them. It's a pipeline problem. Um, and if, and um, it's unfair. Uh, quotas uh, impose another form of bias. Quotas so zero sum game. Some people win and some people lose. And then it could cause backlash and then reduce uh, support. Uh, for diversity measures. Uh, and they also uh, can argue that uh, accepting less qualified women, uh, again, sets them up to fail. Um, and uh, being um, selected based on quota may risk them to be stigmatized because they're considered to be tokens uh, and uh, they're hired uh, on the, that, that basis as opposed to their skills. So there's lots of arguments why that's not a good thing. On the other hand, though, um, uh, there are those who actually uh, say that, in fact, uh, diversity improves meritocracy. And they basically um, all the time, in the same way that I have uh, all along, uh, relying on a question on meritocracy uh, actually perpetuates status quo in this thing. And contrary to what people say that there's not enough good women or skilled women uh, uh, applying, uh, we've already shown in all these examples of research that yes, there are equally competent women applying. The CDs are equal, but they're just not recognized. So the biases, both implicit and structural, work against uh, recruiting, work against the recognition of uh, equally uh, qualified uh, women. So. As a result of that, because there's so many entrenched and implicit biases that we can't realistically think through and overcome, we need a structured process to do the overcoming for us in their argument. And uh, finally, uh, those who are pro um, quotas basically say that really uh, incremental uh, small steps has gotten us nowhere so far. And for you to uh, create um, a group that is not marginalized and to actually affect change, you need a, a shock to the system. You need uh, at least 40% uh, of the group members to move it from being marginalized and stigmatized and still sort of token into the mainstream. And for you to see actual changes uh, come through. And what is the, the uh, evidence in the literature that diversity does improve meritocracy. I'm going to tell you about three studies. There are more in the literature. So Campbell et al. Uh, looked at um, the working groups um, publications uh, of 157 uh, uh, working groups, uh, scientific working groups, uh, looked at all their publications, and essentially found that uh, gender her her heterogeneous uh, working groups produce um, publications with significantly more citations and those that were uh, gender homogeneous. Kim and Stark looked at the boardroom and also found that uh, gender diversity increased uh, their board effectiveness because of 
uh, increased number of skill sets that are brought into the boardroom um, that females bring uh, to um, all male boardrooms, and also uh, the different uh, variety and the different um, uh, types of skill sets that uh, weren't there before. And finally, this interesting study is a Swedish study, and it's, um, of, um, it's uh, called Gender Quotas and the Crisis of the Mediocre Man. And basically, Sweden um, brought in um, a gender quota for its electoral uh, political voting system, such that all the voting ballots had to have equal female and male candidates. And that was brought in in 1993. So these um, uh, researchers basically uh, wanted to look at uh, how this affected the competencies uh, of the political parties before this gender quota was put in uh, and after. So they looked at all the, um, they used a complex uh, modeling equation and they looked at um, the measures of competency of political parties before and after the quota was put in. And they found that the most competent, uh, the parties that gained most incompetency were the ones that had uh, the most women. Um, uh, associated uh, with them. Um, and this was mainly because um, it didn't change the competency of the women, uh, but it did cause a lot of the more mediocre male leaders to drop out. So essentially, competition for more women basically <coughs> took away a lot of the more mediocre, <coughs> raising the whole level of competency of all the women. So, diversity. I hope I've shown you that diversity does not dilute meritocracy, but in fact, the meritocracy. So um, I'm coming towards the end. <laughs> I am basically um, hope that I made the case that um, leadership uh, can be conceptualized as a gendered construct um, embedded in a system of a board of forces. And I hope that I've been able to problematize uh, meritocracy by exposing some of the myths that it ties. But does that mean I'm against meritocracy? That seems to be the M word. Um, no, no, I'm not against meritocracy. What I am against is the unexamined acceptance of the word meritocracy. Okay, all the assumptions that are held with it. So that's what I'm against. And so I do believe that we need to reconstruct, tear it apart, and reconstruct what meritocracy. So what are some of the um, ways that we could do that from an individual program and institutional level? So these are some of the suggestions um, that um, I give. First of all, become aware that we all have implicit biases and that second generation biases uh, are alive and well there in the wall, in the air, in the atmosphere, in your interactions, um, in the leadership. Um, Engage in leadership development uh, and networking. Uh, seek leadership. A lot of, uh, I mean, the literature say that uh, a lot of women don't seek leadership when they feel 100% they're prepared. Whereas men are more risk takers and they'll just jump in. So, jump in. Um, so, um, engage in leadership um, opportunities, mentoring, sponsorship uh, opportunities, create, create allies, uh, both amongst men and women as well as underrepresented groups, um, and advocate for institutional and um, systemic uh, change. From the point of view of the programs, now I started my study actually um, critiquing, thinking there's something wrong with our leadership programs because they all do not, not all, but most of them do not typically bring in the issue of gender in leadership, and they focus specifically on skills building. So the idea of a leader is based on your ability. The better you are, the more skilled you are, the more likely you're going to be a leader, which I hope I've shown that it's not, it's not so simple as that. So I think that leadership programs should actually change to integrate, um, change their focus from being solely on leadership skills development to include a systems perspective and to integrate implicit bias, diversity, and gender issues in the training. Uh, I do also believe that there's a place mm -hmm. for women, specific women's leadership uh, development, um, leadership development programs, not in isolation um, from uh, sort of the um, the typical leadership um, development uh, program. And I think it's important to um, also uh, involve the men in that because there are very specific issues uh, that are associated with um, women's leadership. 
and also to enable more networking, coaching, mentorship, and sponsorship. And from the institutional point of view, uh, I think we need to truly commit to um, diversity, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and uh, as uh, adapted from Kang and Kathleen, they did a really wonderful article on this. Uh, but do we really treat um, gender, uh, gender equity as an innovation, an innovation challenge? Except that exists, that there's inequality and inequity, except that exists and except that we need to do something about it. Um, also, to uh, change institutional norms and recruitment policies, uh, starting with the top. Um, enable individuals to act as change agents uh, and implement very uh, clear behavioral uh, guidelines rather than attitudinal. Uh, their point in their article is that we can't change our implicit uh, biases, that they're just hired wires. So, bring up protocols that would counter that by making them very clear and action oriented. Uh, plan, such as I mentioned for this. Um, and then also ensure um, organizational accountability through ongoing measurement and making sure that there are goals set and that they uh, and measure and make sure that they are reached. So um, I wind down my talk uh, to uh, again raise the limitations. I do realize as I mentioned uh, I use a very binary um, approach to um, my talk, uh, basically for um, simplicity, so to speak, uh, but also um, sort of jump as a jumping off point from the study that uh, we did uh, on uh, uh, looking at women and, um, and um, men leaders um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the faculty of health sciences here. Um, and um, I did focus specifically on women's underrepresentation in uh, academic leadership, uh, but you know the same can apply for men underrepresented in female-dominated um, organizations and professions, which I haven't examined. But I think the general principles or underrepresented um, groups, uh, similar principles are pertinent. Um, and also, most of my literature is from the um, North American and Europe, um, and I also. Uh, um, uh, Realize the limitations of that. So, um, to summarize, then, uh, as I mentioned, leadership uh, is a gender construct which is embedded in system of origin. So, taking a more system uh, view of what leadership is, it's not just all about your uh, ability for meritocracy, uh, because the notion and the word meritocracy uh, often blinds us to our own implicit biases and it blinds institutions. To embed it by, um, and that can lead to perpetuation of inequities and, and of the gender gap. Um, and diversity does not uh, reduce meritocracy, in fact, it does the opposite. Uh, so, I put forth to you again um, it's not that I am against meritocracy, I, it's that meritocracy needs to be critically implemented, uh, deconstructed. Uh, and we need to work together at the individual program and institutional level to critically reflect on this and to reconstruct meritocracy towards more equity and diversity and inclusion. So, for that, um, thank you for your attention.